Meyer. Yes, 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 of course, yeah. Uh, do you hear me? Is this microphone working? Yes, yes very good. Uh, so is everybody else, I, uh, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to attend this interesting meeting. I have to apologize. I do not really belong to the circle of experts in, in viruses. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure organizers, uh, although they did in general a very good job, they may have made one mistake of inviting me. And I apologize in advance if you find my presentation boring or uninteresting. Uh, what I will tell you is a bit of a story about physics of branched polymers, which does have something to do with viruses, but I will be mostly concentrated on branched polymers themselves. We'll touch on viruses a little bit. But I will start with this uh, picture which shows the story of my first work uh, about viruses. Uh, I was thinking about how double helical DNA could be ejected from the bacteriophage. Uh, some of the people here know this work, and in fact, uh, Riz Garman, uh, he has a very interesting poster over here where his work with Manoharan actually opens the new ground in terms of experimental observation of this phenomenon. So what the phenomenon is, you have a spring and you have DNA which is driven outside by this spring, which is described by, by this little very trivial equation here. Uh, the only trick, of course, there are two tricks. One is to find what is the friction coefficient psi, and another one, what is the free energy? So you first have to solve, within this framework, you first have to solve equilibrium problem. How much free energy is there given the amount of DNA inside? Uh, and we attempted to solve this problem. And this was actually the first, it was supposed to be the first publication in the series. But, uh, and what we did is we, derived this type of structure, which is called spool, and now it's considered to be either trivial or wrong, and so on. But the interesting point is that anonymous referee said about this first part that what we constructed was a perpetual motion machine. I am still puzzled by how one can construct a perpetual motion machine by just calculating the free energy of an equilibrium structure. So the reason why I'm recalling this story is because I thought maybe this anonymous referee is now sitting in the room. <laughs> Will the annoying referee please identify the <laughs> Revenge of the Empire. Yes, so I thought maybe this person could explain to me privately what, what he or she actually meant. Uh, uh, but really, most of my talk, I will be talking about these branched polymers. And I have here two pictures from two papers. One is drawn by Angela Rosa and another by either Robin Brunschma or his student Joshua Kelly. I do not know who did that. Kelly. Kelly, OK. So this is simpler. This is more artful. Uh, but the idea is, this, is still the same, and you know this idea better than I do. And I will be assuming that this approximation, which is obviously an appro imperfect approximation, I will assume that it works, and I will consider something of this sort. Uh, okay, so what do people know about these branched polymers? It started in 1949. Uh, by Zim and Stockmeyer, and what they showed is that ideal uh, branch polymer, which means po branch polymer which has no excellent volume, uh, different pieces of it don't see each other, go through each other freely, and its branch pattern is completely random. This object has the size 
Jason radius, which is proportional to its molecular weight or number of monomers to the power of one quarter. Uh, this is famous result by, by Zim and Stockmeyer, which is basic for, for the field. So the interpretation of that result is the following. Imagine that you have this brain structure, and this is how abstract I want to think about brain structure. I don't want to think about real RNA. This is my abstract view. And what I want to, to do is I want to emphasize one particular, I call it chemical diameter. Other people call it ladder distance when they think about DNA. I will keep calling it diameter, something that a typical connection between one and, and the other, and I can choose any one, basically, a random one. And then the statement is, because this polymer is random, as Avi Ben Shaul showed to us, if this branching pattern is random, then the length of this object, chemical length of this thick line is proportional to square one square root, and then this line folds in space such that its size in space is another square root, and you have square root of square root, and this is n to the one quarter. This is how Zeeman Stockmeyer uh, theory works. Uh, now, an important distinction which I want to emphasize and which I want you to keep in mind all the time, at least those of you who want to listen to me, uh, is if you have this branched object whose branching pattern is repeated here, you can swell it, expand, you have to expand it because it's too compact to live in the real three-dimensional space. So you have to expand it, and you can do it in two ways. Either you can stretch every of this connecting little chain like this, while branching pattern is still the same. Chemical structure, or in RNA terminology, the secondary structure of RNA is the same. It's not affected. Or you can do it differently. You can rearrange if it's possible. You can rearrange branching pattern to make it, for instance, like this comb, and then uh, you can compensate uh, for some excessive stretching of some of these uh, red chains. So there are two modes. One corresponds to quenched or fixed branching pattern, and another corresponds to annealed branching pattern. So this is the main distinction, and I will uh, follow it. Actually, what happened is it is the information particularly useful for our chairman. Uh, many years ago, uh, my friends uh, Sasha Gutin, uh, Eugene Shachnovich, and myself, we had uh, two months of sort of free time, and in that time we performed four papers on, well, we wrote four papers on branched polymer. So, so far, two of them are a little bit known to, to people, and two of them are completely unknown. So, Robin, there are two more which you can learn. I'll, I'll follow your comparison. <laughs> okay, and recently, Angela Rosa, Ralph Everest, and Michael Rubinstein, and myself, we wrote a review on this annealed system. Uh, so, how does it work? How do we describe the simplest approach to describe the behavior of these two types of branched polymers? So, first of all, we describe them in terms of three relationships. First of all, how overall radius or generation radius grows with the molecular weight, and this is characterized by the power nu. Second of all, how this chemical diameter grows with L. And uh, Avi Ben Shaul told us that for uh, this virus-like RNA, this thing goes like N to the two thirds, so there is oh, two thirds. And then there is uh, another relation between overall size and this uh, path length. Uh, if you assume that this is ideal polymer, this quantity will be one half. But generally, there is this relation. 
Now, according to Flory, we think that free energy of this object consists essentially of entropy and energy. This is minus Ts, entropy, and this is energy. And energy is not particularly remarkable, un uninteresting. It's just energy of some clump of material at the given density. It's not, but entropy is very dependent on what you can do. You can only stretch your bonds, or you can also rearrange your branching pattern. If you can only stretch, then uh, the first naive expectation, which turns out to be right by for, but for non-trivial reasons, would be that it goes more or less like you, you take one of these chemical diameters and you stretch it. And this is the distance between its ends, and this is big L. It's the length of this one of these chemical diameters. But this is very non-trivial, because you, you, this formula looks like you stretch only one diameter, and everything else is inert and does not participate in smearing. So in fact, this formula is right for subtle reason, which I will not even explain. Uh, and which I will illustrate using this picture on the next slide. But if you have an annealed polymer which can rearrange its branching pattern, then you have an additional entropy, which is here, uh, and which we can, uh, that one we can understand. Uh, you have additional possibility to rearrange. So this is independent of R, so therefore it is independent of how the object is placed in space. It's, uh, okay, so about this formula, what is L? I told you it is one of the chemical diameters, but which one? It turns out that Kramer's theorem, and here is Hendrik Kramer's, very interesting man, uh, Kramer's theorem, uh, the most known part of Kramer's theorem is about computing JH radius, average JH radius of this uh, branched object. But I want to do more. I want to do probability distribution because the exponential of this entropy is the probability distribution of JH radius. So I, wa I want to, to, to do more and I want to find probability distribution and it turns out that probability distribution is controlled by maximal eigenvalue of certain matrix, which I will explain in a second. While classical Kramer theorem tells about average, which is controlled by trace, by the sum of diagonal elements. So generally, this Kramer's matrix is constructed the following way. You take matrix elements Km, which corresponds to bond K and bond M, and on the tree, bond K and bond M, they separate the tree into three parts. The part on the left of bond K, on the right of bond M, and in the middle. It's like a sandwich. So you take K of K, the number of monomers in this red region, times M of M, which is the number of monomers in blue region. You multiply, and you are almost home. I thought you are home. Uh, but you are not, because I for, when I, I thought about it, I forgot about the fact that in the world there are some negative numbers except uh, in addition to positive numbers. And George Kelly showed that, in fact, sometimes matrix elements are with plus and sometimes with minus. And he has perfect algorithm which shows when it's plus and when it's minus then this L turns out to be maximal eigenvalue of this Kramer's matrix. So I invite you to realize that there is simple computational algorithm, and for those who want to, to use this, it, it's an easy computational trick. Now, uh, I have to go back one second. Uh, OK, so if you look at the annealed situation for, for a yield polymer, already this formula predicts something interesting. Independently of what is R, independently of how your polymer swells in space, 
uh, if you minimize this over L, you find optimal chemical structure, optimal branching pattern for given degree of swelling, which means for the given value of nu. For given value of nu, you find value of rho. And this is a prediction which you can test, and uh, you see all the data available in the literature go very well with this uh, uh, prediction, so this is a reasonable prediction. Uh, that means annealed objects do follow this separate optimization of their chemical structure with respect to uh, their branching pattern. And there are more details about various indices, uh, which also are in good agreement, but let, let me skip that. So based on this Flory theory, what we did uh, in a recent paper, which was uh, in a special issue dedicated to somebody in the room, uh, we use this theory to describe how uh, uh, much work you have to do in order to compress a uh, given RNA into the uh, closed volume. And you know better than I do that randomly reshuffled RNA are, have different branching pattern. And therefore, we expect that there is different value of this L, different values of this chemical diameter, or more specifically, eigenvalue of Kramer's matrix. The, the work needed to be done will be different. So the, the idea is that in this representation of free energy, the interaction part is pretty much the same, independent of branching pattern. It depends only on the amount of, of material, on the, of N, on the number of monomers. It does not depend very much on the type of branching. But the elastic part, the uh, entropic part, is very sensitive to the type of branching pattern. Uh, so this part you can interpolate using uh, flory hagen theory or Van der Waals theory, uh, but it is, the result is insensitive to it. So the, the, our answer in terms of this work of compression, our answer is basically this one, the difference between randomly reshuffled uh, RNA and the real RNA of this particular virus. I have not, no idea what this virus is. I have no knowledge of, of that. Uh, but there is a difference between randomly reshuffled RNA, wh whose work of compression is given by this line, and below it there is a green line. Uh, in fact, we have two couples, two, two pairs of these lines, one for Van der Waals approximation, another for uh, Flory Huggins approximation, and this seems quite uninteresting. But the difference, the difference is predicted quite reliably. The difference between these two types of RNA is, is given by this. So that's what we predict for uh, 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 this uh, work of compression and the difference of work of compression. And in the end of the day, there is this simplified formula which tells you that the difference of work comp of compression between molecules I and J, let's say randomly reshuffled and, and the real uh, viral one, is controlled by the difference of these leading eigenvalues of Kramer's matrix. I'm not sure Kramers would have liked to discover that his matrix is somehow related to these viruses, but, but, it, but it is related. Okay, so the question now is, can we do better? This is Flory theory. This is based on the trick of assuming that there is elastic part and interaction part and uh, it is known in physics that this is sort of a magic. There is some magic cancellation of errors. Uh, we never know whether it will work for Flory theory or not. So Flory theory is a nice thing, but it's capricious. So can we do more reliably, more 
can we develop a more sophisticated tool to do such calculations? So uh, since that's the main assumption, which I did not emphasize, the main assumption of this uh, work of compression calculation was that secondary structure of RNA does not change at all when you compress it. Okay, so let us now, in, in reality we know from these simulations like Vienna and others that there are many secondary structures, maybe hundreds or thousands, I forgot, uh, within a fraction of KT of the ground state. So maybe let's go to the opposite limit and say that there are many different secondary structures, and that is annealed limit. This is nothing else but the annealed limit. So let's go to annealed limit and let us uh, consider what happens in the annealed limit. And, then, and, and our goal now is to develop a good, honest, sophisticated physics theory. So how would do it? Uh, as a reminder, there is a well-developed machinery, theoretical machinery, to study the confinement of a flexible polymer. This actually turns out to be based on Schrodinger equation. There is mapping between this problem of confinement of polymer chain and the problem of confinement of quantum particle. And I'll show to you on the simplest possible example how this analogy works. So the, uh, I know that many people are not particularly uh, 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 knowledgeable about quantum mechanics, but one thing that people typically remember about quantum mechanics is uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle tells you that uncertainty of coordinate times uncertainty of momentum is Planck constant. So if you want to confine your particle within distance r, that means you have to, as you go to smaller and smaller r, you have to give it more and more momentum because r times momentum should be still Planck constant. So Planck constant divided by r will be the amount of momentum it has. Planck constant divided by r squared will be kinetic energy. The more you confine your particle, so poor particle confined in tight prison cell, it runs very fast back and forth, it has a lot of kinetic energy. Similarly, poor polymer chain confined in tight compartment, it goes back and forth like crazy and has much entropy. It turns out that in this mapping, entropy is the same as kinetic energy. It maps to one another. It's not the same, but it maps on one another. As a result, the confinement of linear polymer chain always go, uh, confinement price always goes like one over R square. This is nothing but uncertainty principle. You can do it mathematically by doing this Schrodinger equation. Now, interesting remark for experts, how about this picture? When you confine, instead of confining a flexible polymer, you confine, let's say, worm-like chain or double helical DNA. Uh, in this case, Schrodinger equation description is not working. But it turns out that in the early days of quantum mechanics, there was a man named Oscar Klein. Uh, he developed a version of quantum mechanics, which is exactly this. And you can solve hydrogen atom in Klein's quantum mechanics, and this is your DNA in, in a capsule, which I think. Is it the same Klein of the Klein Gordon equation? Yes, it is the same. Yes, yes, it is the same Klein as Klein Gordon equation. Yes. Uh, The confinement. Yes, it's unfavorable. 
it's, it's unfavorable. It increases free energy, which means it decreases entropy. Yeah, it's, it's unfavorable. It's very unfavorable. It's very unfavorable historical circumstance that entropy is defined with a minus sign. But uh, yeah, it's, unfa it's thermodynamically unfavorable. Uh, okay, so uh, now in order to develop this theory, uh, you, you need to know something of Dijon's legacy. He studied uh, this annealed branch polymer, but he did not consider placing it in space. It was just partition sum of, of fluctuating secondary structure. But you can uh, 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 yeah, there is the order of my slides is slightly illogical. I apologize. I, I must have messed up these two slides, but anyway, we will manage. So speaking about confinement work, we were talking about confinement. So what confinement work? Now let's consider confinement not of linear chain for, for which from uncertainty principle, I derived for you that confinement costs one over R squared. Now for branch polymer, it will cost one over R to the power of four, and it follows from these three lines of logic. Jewish radius without confinement, remember Zeeman, Stockmeyer, n to the one quarter. Now confinement entropy, must be some power of this ratio, R over Rg. What else could be there? There could be nothing else unitless. So some power x, and how do we find this x? We say that confinement entropy must be proportional to n, must be extensive. Entropy is always extensive. So you obtain this formula. So it's not uncertainty principle. It is something else. Uh, it is one or Well, well, there is minus sign. Minus sign is, is missing. And also, I didn't say that x is positive. X is, the way it is written, x would be negative. So x here should be minus one, minus four. Right? Uh, so there is minus four. x is minus four. I think it's, it's okay. Yes. It is true, but in this case, density is not the right thing to follow. I, I can explain it in the following way, Avi. Uh, if you uh, have a large brain structure and you want to confine it in this place, that means you have to take this part of your brain structure. It should be compacted to go there in this orange size domain. You have to take this one you have to confine this one too. You have to confine every piece. And this is why it is extensive. Because it has no excluded volume, so you confine every piece independently of every, every other piece. Uh, you are right that my statement that entropy is always extensive is a cheap one. I wanted to bypass it. But, but the essence of the argument is very uh, rigorous. It is indeed linear. OK, thank you. So following now Dijen, uh, we developed a little more sophisticated version of Dijen theory in which we follow a spatial dependence of everything. These equations are the same equations which Dijen derived except we have now spatial dependence. So we consider how this object goes in, into confinement, and accordingly 
Inside the potential well, we have some circumstances, some values of this potential energy is little phi, and this phi 1 is potential energy for the chain ends, phi 3 is potential energy for branch points, and it is perhaps low potential energy inside the confinement volume and very high potential energy outside, something like this. And this P star is the eigenvalue, so we have this equation. So now if you look at this equation, equation for psi, psi is the distribution of the endpoints of arbitrary chemical diameter. Remember, chemical diameter, secret line, this is the distribution of endpoints. This chemical diameter is linear polymer. It's not a big surprise that this is Schrodinger equation. It is the same Schrodinger equation which I had three slides before. This Schrodinger equation for psi, it's the same thing here. Same Schrodinger equation for linear polymer, which is now chemical diameter of a branch structure. Except this potential energy for branch points is now replaced by effective potential energy, which involves the idea that every monomer of, the, of this chemical diameter actually is also pulled or pushed or somehow affected by the whole long branch that emanates from it. Uh, So this is how this mathematics works, and accordingly there is this function which describes how branchy it is, and this function is the solution of this nonlinear equation. For a long time, I was much puzzled how these complex looking equations could possibly overcome the fact that this is Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger equation obeys Uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle gives you 1 over r squared, and this should give you 1 over r to the power 4. That was a big puzzle, and I know for some people mathematical puzzles sound artificial, but for us theorists it is uh, a subject that does not allow us to sleep quietly at night. So it was... A, Capital D, where is capital D? Oh, this one. This one is uh, my artful notation for three. This is how I write three in Russian. <laughs> this is space dimension bill. So this is six, a square over six. This comes from space dimension. Uh, okay, so we published this paper in a journal which I doubt anyone in this audience ever publishes in. It's called Low Temperature Physics. And the reason why we published it there is because my teacher, Ilya Lipschitz, turns 100 this year, and we were invited to contribute to this uh, issue of the journal. Uh, so what we did is we consider these very equations, we honestly solved them, and we discovered the desired 1 over power uh, uh, 4, 1 over r to the 4. And the reason how it works is the following. We first of all consider this free uh, polymer away from the potential well. Then we dip it into the potential well, but we assume that potential well is very extended in space. And then we slowly hug this polymer into smaller and smaller volume potential well. And that required this work little omega, and little omega comes in these equations in the form of eigenvalues. And it turns out that this effective field which enters in Schrodinger equation through mathematical manipulations, this effective field is not flat bottom potential well. 
beautiful surprise is that this field is a harmonic oscillator field. It becomes parabolic because branch points which sit in the middle of this potential well, these branch points are repelled strongly from the walls because in each branch, from each branch point, the whiskers of the branches come out and these whiskers touch the boundaries and say, no, 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 don't, don't go there. It's very unfavorable. Please don't approach the walls. And this repulsion keeps branch points in the middle. And that repulsion generates this effective field, big phi, which generates parabolic potential. And that solves the problem. OK, so here are uh, our numerical data, which confirm this this analytical result, and so on. Now, I think in the interest of time, I will skip this story, which is uh, the analogy between branch RNAs found in some, in, in some type of viruses and territories uh, which are found in chromo chromosome DNA. I will skip that, and uh, I will acknowledge that most of uh, what I told you was done with Robin, and actually on Robin's uh, push, uh, uh, because he is a real virus expert, and he keeps pushing me, and I'm not an expert at all. So Josh Kelly is his student. Ralph Everais, Angela Rosa, and Michael Rubinstein, we collaborated a lot on these annealed polymers. Gutin and Shachnovich were involved many years ago in this branch polymer work. Roy recently involved me in some simul simulating uh, discussion. There are some pictures here, and I want to uh, thank you for attention. But before I finish, I, I want to spend one minute uh, going completely out of the box and saying the following. I was sitting here for several days listening to uh, talks, uh, and since I'm completely out of the field, I thought maybe I can allow myself to make a stupid uh, uh, speculation, uh, which may be useful or may be completely useless, but I could not resist thinking when I was listening to you uh, that uh, the following, uh, in general, when we see, when we look at the uh, uh, life around us, we realize that uh, although life forms are infinitely diverse, uh, it is still believable somehow that uh, possible possibilities of life forms are even more diverse. That evolution could have developed many more things which didn't find necessary to develop. On the other hand, looking at part of the, of the biosphere, which is viruses, looking through the lens of, of your presentations, I thought that diversity of viruses, given the limited number of components and limited size and so on, it seems that possibly the diversity of viruses approaches what is possible, what is allowed by the laws of physics. And is it not possible? I just want to ask him. Maybe this question is idiotic. And OK, so disregard it. But I want to ask you, is it not possible to, maybe challenging, but is it not possible to start thinking about uh, follow a question. Based on laws of physics and knowing that there are three components, proteins, either RNA or DNA in limited amount, and maybe lipid membrane, some cases, maybe there is some sort of ergodic description. What you can do, what are in principle possible 
combination of these ingredients. That would be an interesting thing to answer if, if anyone could. At least I would be interested to know the answer. Thank you.